Um, if you don't want to be on video, make sure you mute your, um, your camera. Um, so my name is Martha Burtis. I work here in the CoLab at Plymouth State University. And um, 15 and 15 is a series that we are running for the month of September, Monday through Thursday from 12 to 12.15 every day, talking about um, a quick, uh, talking quickly about a topic related to teaching and learning. And today's topic that I'm gonna be presenting about is transparent teaching. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk about this is this is a, um, a, a topic that I've been interested in for a while, especially since arriving here at PSU um, a, a couple of years ago. And in particular, I, I noticed that when it would come up in conversations, um, it was clear that there was interest in it. It was something I was really interested in, but it was also clear that some people weren't quite sure what we meant by it. And also that the practices that people were um, ascribing to transparent teaching, there were lots of different practices. And I thought it might be interesting to try and sorry, my clock is going off. Um, it might be interesting to kind of get on the same page um, about this. So the first question I wanna kind of address is why would we do this? Why would we um, want to engage in this um, idea of transparent teaching? And the ideas here are basically mine. Like this is why I personally am interested in it. If you have other reasons that you are interested in this topic, feel free to drop them in the chat. But the first one here, and it's something that I've witnessed myself as I've pivoted to doing, um, engaging in some of these practices, is the potential to build stronger relationships with my students, really reciprocal relationships that I find can um, help build classroom community and really help build um, a, a, a kind of intrinsic motivation among my students. Um, it, there's also the potential to really um, address for students the why, what I call the why and the how of teaching. So helping them to understand what it is that we do when we teach, why we make the choices we do, how we go about designing classes, assignments, assessment, um, so that they can kind of get a look into the work of teaching um, and, and understand and respect it as this intentional practice that we engage in. Something that gets talked about a lot when we um, talk about transparent teaching is this idea of the hidden curriculum. Um, you know, there's been more and more attention paid to this in recent years that some of our students come to college not really knowing a whole lot about how universities work, how, how college works, how college courses work, and they're at a disadvantage when they don't have that um, insight. And so using transparent teaching as a way to address the hidden curriculum. As I said before, those stronger relationships can really, really lead to um, building more intrinsic motivation among students when they feel more connected to you and to the course itself. And finally, and I'm not gonna talk about this in great detail today, which is why it's in parentheses, but one thing I've been really interested in kind of delving into is whether or not engaging in transparent te teaching allows us to kind of de-labor or at least re-labor teaching. So rethinking what kind of labor goes into teaching. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the research on why this matters, why we should be talking about this as a practice. Um, one of so some of these are studies that have um, that are looking at, at sort of some of the outcomes of transparent teaching and what those are related to in terms of student success. Um, and one uh, study from 2011 showed that there's um, there's a real increase in the sense of belonging among um, students. When there's an increase in, in the sense of belonging among students, it can reduce the impact of inequalities within higher education. Um, another study that was looking in particular at African-American students found that students who are helped to understand intelligence as a malleable concept, as opposed to a um, something that's kind of one and done, like you're as smart as you are and you can't get any smarter. Um, when they see this intelligence as more malleable, they're more likely to succeed. Um, we already know from research that minority and underrepresented students in particular are less likely to um, have a real grasp of the hidden curriculum and understand how our institutions function. And finally, this study from 2016 that really looked at specific transparent teaching practices found that it led to improved confidence, sense of belonging, as well as metacognitive awareness. So the research is really pointing in useful directions in terms of why we might engage with this. I will say for all of our 15 and 15 um, sessions, we share a handout on the CoLab website. Um, the, the one for this session is already up and it has the links to these studies if you're interested in reading more. 
So what exactly are we talking about when we talk about transparent teaching? Um, a lot of it is about helping students understand things. And the first thing is helping students um, understand how they're learning, um, understanding the process of learning, talking explicitly about how they learn, um, helping students understand why we design education and educational experiences in particular ways. So really bringing them into the fold and not just assigning work, but talking to them about the choices that we make when we assign work. Um, again, helping students understand more explicitly how universities and education in general works, how these processes and institutions function. Um, and also helping students understand how their education um, is linked both to their life outside of the university that they're living right now, as well as the goals they have for themselves post university after they graduate. Um, and then these last two I'll talk about in greater detail. These are those, those first four are really, if you look at the literature around transparent teaching, these are really what, what people talk about. These last two, I admit, are a little bit more me, um, that I feel like there's, um, with transparent teaching, teaching, there's a real opportunity to build mutual respect between faculty and students, as well as making space within our classes for student agency, um, and finally to really rethink power dynamics in the classroom. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. There is a pretty well-known framework and program called the, um, the TILT program, uh, which stands for Transparency in Learning and Teaching um, that existed for quite some time. Um, Robin can share right now in the chat uh, the link to the, the TILT website. Um, there's, there's a wealth of resources on there um, about the research, about the practices, about how institutions and individuals can really engage with transparent teaching. I wanted to talk in particular about this one practice that they promote related to assignment design. And what's interesting about it is that it's a rel relatively small pedagogical move um, that faculty make in terms of how they both design and present assignments in class. But the research, that 2016 study that I mentioned before was really looking at the application of this method. The research really shows that can have big impacts. The first is that when introducing an assignment, we're really explicit about the purpose of the assignment. And that means talking to students about what kind of skills they're going to practice, um, what kind of content they're gonna engage with and what kind of knowledge they're gonna engage, uh, they're gonna gain. Then when it comes to the work itself of an assignment, being very explicit about what students are going to be doing and how they're gonna be doing it. So what actions, what um, techniques, what, um, methods they might uh, uh, use in order to be successful, um, what steps they might take, what they might need to avoid, what pitfalls they might encounter. Um, so giving them a little bit of a roadmap. And then finally being explicit about the criteria, which could mean um, being upfront about a checklist or rubric in advance, so students can self-evaluate along the way. It also could mean providing examples, real world examples or examples of past work for students to look at. I want to pause here for a second because people who know me well might look at this slide and say that doesn't sound a lot like Martha and I will confess that when I look at um, this tilt approach uh, at face value, there are some things here that give me pause and that just has to do a little bit with the kind of educator I am. I'm a big believer in emergent learning, in co-design with students. I'm not a big um, advocate of really um, heavily constructed rubrics. And um, I worry about giving students too much direction and too many examples in um, the possibility that it could just kind of stifle where they go. Um, however, I think that there's ways to apply this methodology across um, the board, depending on how you teach and, um, and your own curriculum. And so I think being explicit about perfect purpose, task, and criteria in whatever way makes sense for you and works for you and your students is absolutely something worth examining. Um, this is just a quote from that study in 2016. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but basically what it showed is that students who received this kind of instruction um, saw gains in these three areas, academic confidence, sense of belonging, and as well as mastery of the skills that employers value most when hiring. So some interesting outcomes to be uh, considered. So for the, the next five minutes, I really just wanna talk about what I'm labeling these stages of transparent teaching. And I wanna be upfront that this is my labeling. This doesn't come from Tilt or anywhere else. So if you, if you disagree with them, um, all the blame comes to me. 
Um, but in looking at the literature and thinking about these practices, it seemed to me that there's a little bit of a continuum that people might move through. And where you are on this, it's not so much that everybody should move from stage one to stage three, but understanding where you are on this continuum may, may point you in interesting directions, both in terms of, well, maybe there are some things you're a stage twoer, but there are some things in stage one you're not doing that you might want to do, or maybe you want to reach above and or beyond and look at some of the, the stages beyond where you are right now. So folks who I say would say are in stage one of transparent teaching might be saying things like, well, I always create rubrics. I always share them with my students. I always go over my course objectives really explicitly and I relate them to assignments so students can see how those objectives play out throughout the course. Um, I'm upfront about the course schedule so that students know right from the beginning when things are gonna be due, they can plan their semester around that and be really mindful of their, of their scheduling. Um, I'm good about providing step-by-step -step instructions, especially for complicated assignments. And in addition to these course level objectives, um, I might have assignment level objectives and even daily learning objectives that I'm transparent about with my students. So to me, that's kind of basic transparent teaching, very stage one. Um, if you're doing those things, that's great. Where would you go from there? So stage two, I would say, is when we're getting into things like, I talk about the goals of an assignment and why I'm an assign assigning it. So this gets a little bit into some of those tilt practices, um, talking about purpose. Um, I invite students to co-design with me. So I might invite them to have input into an assignment design or into um, an assessment. I talk to students explicitly about how people learn, you might, maybe even the research of how people learn and how it might relate to their own progress and their own struggles in the classroom. I talk about my experiences as a learner. So I acknowledge to my students that I am always continuing to learn and I talk about what that means and what that looks like for me. Um, I engage students in assessment and grading. So I don't see assessment and grading as a completely top-down process, but I find ways for my students to be involved in it. Um, and this last one is kind of a thread through all of it, which is I look for every opportunity I can to sort of narrate the process of my teaching um, out loud to my students. So that might mean things like talking to them about um, choices that you made and, um, and struggles you had uh, when it comes to picking, choosing an assignment or, or giving instructions for assignment so that you're really giving students a view into the work that you're doing both before you even walk into the classroom as well as during a, a class itself. Um, again, the idea being that we're trying to give students more of an understanding of teaching as an intentional practice, not an arbitrary thing that we do that they receive, but instead um, seeing us as practitioners of a discipline of teaching and that um, and, and to build some respect am, among our students about what that involves um, through this constant kind of narration of process. And then finally, stage three, and you'll notice that I've labeled this critical, which does not mean that these are critical, everybody should do these. What this is really a nod to is that this is where I see the potential for transparent teaching to intersect with the values and practices of critical pedagogy. And I think there's a lot of potential here. So this might be um, things like I invite my students to be transparent with me about their learning experiences. This is one that um, I, I've done myself in classes that has been tremendously transformative for me and I think for my students. Um, which is opportunities in, in class for students to sort of unpack with me sort of their past experiences, what they've experienced as a learner and as a student in the past. And the reason why this becomes important is that I discover there's kind of an undercurrent very often um, beneath the class that's based on those past experiences that if I'm not really aware of that these exist or could exist, I may ascribe certain um, intentionality to my students. Like I may think my students are behaving in a particular way or doing a certain thing for reasons that are very different than the real reasons. So I, I find this to be a really interesting um, um, practice as a way to uh, this idea of creating opportunities for students to really be transparent with me. Um, I think of my students as collaborators. So this doesn't just mean I co-design, uh, you know, an assignment with them or an assessment, but I truly think of them as partners and collaborators in my class. And I see this as a, as a, um, a journey that we're in together. I'm willing to rethink, retool, redesign, throw out 
things in my class based on feedback and ideas that I get from my students. I let my students teach me and I acknowledge that. So I let them see me not only as a learner, but as a learner who's being taught by them. Um, and finally, I actively dismantle power structures to make space for students to express their agency and voice. And that really is at the core of critical pedagogy. And it underlines all of these other bullet points. So that brings us to the end of our 15 minutes. That was a lot of information about transparent teaching. If you'd like, if you're at PSU and you'd like to talk more about this, I invite you to make an appointment with the collab or me. Um, I'm always delighted to talk with people about this topic. Thank you for joining us today. We'll hang out for a couple minutes, but you're uh, all welcome to go and we'll see you tomorrow for those who can join us. Thank you.